Chapter Three of Foundation Stones to Happiness and Success. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea Fiore. Foundation Stones to Happiness and Success by James Allen. Chapter Three true actions following on right principles and methods come true actions one who is striving to grasp true principles and work with sound methods will soon come to perceive that details of conduct cannot be overlooked that indeed those details are fundamentally distinctive or creative according to their nature and are of deep significance and comprehensive importance and this perception and knowledge of the nature and power of passing actions will gradually open and grow within him as an added vision a new revelation as he acquires this insight his progress will be more rapid his pathway in life more sure his days more serene and peaceful in all things he will go the true and direct way unswayed and untroubled by the external forces that play around and about him not that he will be indifferent to the welfare and happiness of those about him that is quite another thing but he will be indifferent to their opinions to their ignorance to their ungoverned passions by true actions indeed is meant acting rightly towards others and the right doer knows that his actions in accordance with truth are but for the happiness of those about him and he will do them even though an occasion may arise when someone near to him may advise or implore him to do otherwise true actions may easily be distinguished from faults by all who wish so to distinguish in order that they may avoid false action and adopt true as in the material world we distinguish things by their form color size etc choosing those things which we require and putting by those things which are not useful to us so in the spiritual world of deeds we can distinguish between those that are bad and those that are good by their nature their aim and their effect and can choose and adopt those that are good and ignore those that are bad in all forms of progress avoidance of the bad always precedes acceptance and knowledge of the good just as a child at school learns to do its lessons right by having repeatedly pointed out to it how it has done them wrong if one does not know what is wrong and how to avoid it how can he know what is right and how to practice it bad or untrue actions are those that spring from a consideration of one's own happiness only and ignore the happiness of others that arise in violent disturbances of the mind and unlawful desires or that call for concealment in order to avoid undesirable complications good or true actions are those that spring from a consideration for others that may arise in calm reason and harmonious thought framed on moral principles or that will not involve the doer in shameful consequences if brought into the full light of day the right doer will avoid those acts of personal pleasure and gratification which by their nature bring annoyance pain or suffering to others no matter how insignificant those actions may appear to be he will begin by putting away these he will gain a knowledge of the unselfish and true by first sacrificing the selfish and untrue he will learn not to speak or act in anger or envy or resentment but will study how to control his mind and will restore it to calmness before acting and most important of all he will avoid as he would the drinking of deadly poison those acts of trickery deceit double dealing in order to gain some personal profit of advantage and which lead sooner or later to exposure and shame for the doer of them if a man is prompted to do a thing which he needs to conceal and which he would not lawfully and frankly defend if it were examined of witness he should know by that that it is a wrong act and therefore to be abandoned without a further moment's consideration the carrying out of this principle of honesty and sincerity of action too will further lead him into such a path of thoughtfulness and right doing as will enable him to avoid doing those things 
which would involve him in the deceptive practices of other people before signing papers or entering into verbal or written agreements or engaging himself to others in any way at their request particularly if they be strangers he will first inquire into the nature of the work or undertaking and so enlightened he will know exactly what to do and will be fully aware of the import of his action to the right doer thoughtlessness is a crime thousands of actions done with good intent lead to disastrous consequences because they are acts of thoughtlessness and it is well said that the way to hell is paved with good intentions the man of true action is above all things thoughtful be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves the term thoughtlessness covers a wide field in the realm of deeds it is only by increasing in thoughtfulness that a man can come to understand the nature of actions and can thereby acquire the power of always doing that which is right it is impossible for a man to be thoughtful and act foolishly thoughtfulness embraces wisdom it is not enough that an action is prompted by a good impulse or intention it must arise in thoughtful consideration if it is to be a true action and the man who wishes to be permanently happy in himself and a power for good to others must concern himself only with true actions i did it with the best of intentions is a poor excuse from one who has thoughtlessly involved himself in the wrongdoing of others his bitter experience should teach him to act more thoughtfully in the future true actions can only spring from a true mind and therefore while a man is learning to distinguish and choose between the false and the true he is correcting and perfecting his mind and is thereby rendering it more harmonious and felicitous more efficient and powerful as he acquires the inner eye to clearly distinguish the right in all the details of life and the faith and knowledge to do it he will realize that he is building the house of his character and life upon a rock which the winds of failure and the storms of persecution can never undermine chapter four of foundation stones to happiness and success this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by andrea fiore foundation stones to happiness and success by james allen chapter four true speech truth is known by practice only without sincerity there can be no knowledge of truth and true speech is the beginning of all sincerity truth in all its native beauty and original simplicity consists in abandoning and not doing all those things which are untrue and embracing and doing all those things which are true true speech is therefore one of the elementary beginnings in the life of truth falsehood and all forms of deception slander and all forms of evil speaking these must be totally abandoned and abolished before the mind can receive even a small degree of spiritual enlightenment the liar and slanderer is lost in darkness so deep is his darkness that he cannot distinguish between good and evil and he persuades himself that his lying and evil speaking are necessary and good that he is thereby protecting himself and other people let the would-be student of higher things look to himself and beware of self-delusion if he is given to uttering words that deceive or to speaking evil of others if he speaks in insincerity envy or malice then he has not yet begun to study higher things he may be studying metaphysics or miracles or psychic phenomena or astral wonders he may be studying how to commune with invisible beings to travel invisibly during sleep or to produce curious phenomena he may even study spirituality theoretically and as a mere book study but if he is a deceiver and a backbiter the higher life is hidden from him for the higher things are these uprightness sincerity innocence purity kindness gentleness faithfulness humility patience pity sympathy 
self-sacrifice, joy, goodwill, love. And he who would study them, know them, and make them his own, must practice them. There is no other way. Lying and evil speaking belong to the lowest forms of spiritual ignorance, and there can be no such thing as spiritual enlightenment while they are practiced. Their parents are selfishness and hatred. Slander is akin to lying, but it is even more subtle, as it is frequently associated with indignation, and by assuming more successfully the appearance of truth, it ensnares many who would not tell a deliberate falsehood. For there are two sides to slander. There is the making of repeating of it, and there is the listening to it and acting upon it. The slanderer would be powerless without a listener. Evil words require an ear that is receptive to evil in which they may fall, before they can flourish. Therefore, he who listens to a slanderer, who believes it, and allows himself to be influenced against the person whose character and reputation are defamed, is in the same position as the one who framed or repeated the evil report. The evil speaker is a positive slanderer. The evil listener is a passive slanderer. The two are cooperators in the propagation of evil. Slander is a common vice and a dark and deadly one. An evil report begins in ignorance and pursues its blind way in darkness. It generally takes its rise in a misunderstanding. Someone feels that he or she has been badly treated, and filled with indignation and resentment, unburdens himself to his friends and others in vehement language, exaggerating the enormity of the supposed offense, on account of the feeling of injury by which he is possessed. He is listened to and sympathized with. The listeners, without hearing the other person's version of what has taken place, and on no other proof than the violent words of an angry man or woman, become cold in their attitude towards the one spoken against, and repeat to others what they have been told, and as such repetition is always more or less inaccurate, a distorted and altogether untrue report is soon passing from mouth to mouth. It is because slander is such a common vice that it can work the suffering and injury that it does. It is because so many, not deliberate wrongdoers, and unconscious of the nature of the evil into which they so easily fall, are ready to allow themselves to be influenced against one whom they have hitherto regarded as honorable, that an evil report can do its deadly work. Yet its work is only amongst those who have not altogether acquired the virtue of true speech, the cause of which is a truth-loving mind. When one who has not entirely freed himself from repeating or believing an evil report about another hears of an evil report about himself, his mind becomes a flame and burning resentment, his sleep is broken and his peace of mind is destroyed. He thinks the cause of all his suffering is the other man and what the other man has said about him, and is ignorant of the truth that the root and cause of his suffering lies in his own readiness to believe an evil report about another. The virtuous man, he who has attained to true speech, and whose mind is sealed against even the appearance of evil speaking, cannot be injured and disturbed by any evil reports concerning himself, and although his reputation may for a time be stained in the minds of those who are prone to suggestions of evil, his integrity remains untouched, and his character unsoiled, for no one can be stained by the evil deeds of another, but only by his own wrongdoing. And so, through all misrepresentation, misunderstanding, and contumely, he is untroubled and unrevengeful, his sleep is undisturbed, and his mind remains in peace. True speech is the beginning of a pure, wise, and well-ordered life. If one would attain to purity of life, if he would lessen the evil and suffering of the world, let him abandon falsehood and slander and thought and word. Let him avoid even the appearance of these things, for there are no lies and slander so deadly as those which are half-truths. And let him not be a participant in evil speaking by listening to it. Let him also have compassion on the evil speaker, knowing how such a one is binding himself to suffering and unrest. For no liar can know the bliss of truth, no slanderer can enter into the kingdom of peace. 
by the words which he utters is a man's spiritual condition declared by these also is he finally and infallibly adjudged for as the divine master of the christian world has declared by thy words shalt thou be justified and by thy words shalt thou be condemned chapter five of foundation stones to happiness and success this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea Fiore Foundation Stones to Happiness and Success by James Allen Chapter 5 Equal Mindedness To be equally minded is to be peacefully minded, for a man cannot be said to have arrived at peace who allows his mind to be disturbed and thrown off the balance by occurrences. The man of wisdom is dispassionate, and meets all things with the calmness of a mind in repose and free from prejudice. He is not a partisan, but having put away passion, and is always at peace with himself in the world, not taking sides nor defending himself, but sympathizing with all. The partisan is so convinced that his own opinion and his own side is right, and that all goes contrary to them is wrong that he cannot think there is any good in the other opinion and the other side. He lives in a continual fever of attack and defense, and has no knowledge of the quiet peace of an equal mind. The equal-minded man watches himself in order to check and overcome even the appearance of passion and prejudice in his mind, and by so doing he develops sympathy for others, and comes to understand their position and particular state of mind and as he comes to understand others, he perceives the folly of condemning them and opposing himself to them. Thus there grows up in his heart a divine charity which cannot be limited, but which is extended to all things that live and strive and suffer. When a man is under the sway of passion and prejudice, he is spiritually blind. Seeing nothing but good in his own side, and nothing but evil in another, he cannot see anything as it really is, not even his own side, and not understanding himself, he cannot understand the hearts of others, and thinks it is right that he should condemn them. Thus there grows up in his heart a dark hatred for those who refuse to see him and who condemn him in return. He becomes separated from his fellow man, and confines himself to a narrow torture chamber of his own making sweet and peaceful are the days of the equal-minded man fruitful in good and rich in manifold blessings guided by wisdom he avoids those pathways which lead down to hatred and sorrow and pain and takes those which lead up to love and peace and bliss the occurrences of life do not trouble him nor does he grieve over those things which are regarded by mankind as grievous but which must befall all men in the ordinary course of nature. He is neither elated by success nor cast down by failure. He sees the events of his life arranged in their proper proportions and can find no room for selfish wishes or vain regrets, for vain anticipations and childish disappointments. And how is this equal-mindedness, this blessed state of mind and life acquired? only by overcoming one's self, only by purifying one's own heart, for the purification of the heart leads to unbiased comprehension, unbiased comprehension leads to equal-mindedness, and equal-mindedness leads to peace. The impure man is swept helplessly away on the waves of passion. The pure man guides himself into the harbor of rest. The fool says, I have an opinion. The wise man, goes about his business chapter six of foundation stones to happiness and success this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by andrea fiore foundation stones to happiness and success by james allen Chapter 6 Good Results 
a considerable portion of the happenings of life comes to us without any direct choosing on our part and such happenings are generally regarded as having no relation to our will or character but as appearing fortuitously as occurring without a cause thus one is spoken of as being lucky and another unlucky the inference being that each has received something which he never earned never caused deeper thought and a clearer insight into life convinces us however that nothing appears without a cause that cause and effect are always related in perfect adjustment and harmony that being so every happening directly affecting us is intimately related to our own will and character is indeed an effect justly related to a cause having its seat in our consciousness in a word involuntary happenings of life are the results of our own thoughts and deeds this i admit is not apparent on the surface but what fundamental law even in the physical universe is so apparent if thought investigation and experiment are necessary to the discovery of the principles which relate one material atom to another even so are they imperative to the perception and understanding of the mode of action which relate one mental condition to another and such modes such laws are known by the right doer by him who has acquired an understanding mind by the practice of true actions we reap as we sow those things which come to us though not by our own choosing are by our own causing the drunkard did not choose the delirium tremens or insanity which overtook him but he caused it by his own deeds in this case the law is plain to all minds but where it is not so plain it is none the less true within ourselves is the deep-seated cause of all our sufferings the spring of all our joys alter the inner world of thoughts and the other world of events will cease to bring you sorrow make the heart pure and to you all things will be pure all occurrences happy and in true order within yourselves deliverance must be sought each man his prison makes each hath such lordship as the loftiest ones nay for with powers above around below as with all flesh and whatsoever lives act maketh joy or woe our life is good or bad enslaved or free according to its causation in our thoughts for out of these thoughts spring all our deeds and from these deeds come equitable results we cannot seize good results violently like a thief and claim and enjoy them but we can bring them to pass by setting in motion the cause within ourselves men strive for money sigh for happiness and would gladly possess wisdom yet fail to secure these things while they see others to whom these blessings appear to come unbidden the reason is that they have generated causes which prevent the fulfillment of their wishes and efforts each life is a perfectly woven network of causes and effects of efforts or lack of efforts and results and good results can only be reached by initiating good efforts good causes the doer of true actions who pursues sound methods grounded on right principles will not need to strive and struggle for good results they will be there as the effects of his righteous rule of life he will reap the fruit of his own actions and the reaping will be in gladness and peace this truth of sowing and reaping in the moral sphere is a simple one yet men are slow to understand and accept it we have been told by a wise one that the children of darkness are wiser in their day than the children of light and who would expect in the material world to reap and eat where he had not sown and planted or who would expect to reap wheat in the field where he had sown tares and would fall to weeping and complaining if he did not yet this is just what men do in the spiritual field of mind and deed they do evil and expect to get from it good and when the bitter harvesting comes in all its ripened fullness they fall into despair and bemoan the hardness and injustice of their lot usually attributing it to the evil deeds of others refusing even to admit the possibility of its cause being hidden in themselves in their own thoughts and deeds the children of light 
those who are searching for the fundamental principles of right living with a view to making themselves into wise and happy beings must train themselves to observe this law of cause and effect in thought word and deed as implicitly and obediently as the gardener obeys the law of sowing and reaping he does not even question the law he recognizes and obeys it when the wisdom which he instinctively practices in his garden is practiced by men in the garden of their minds when the law of the sowing of deeds is so fully recognized that it can no longer be doubted or questioned then it will be just as faithfully followed by the sowing of those actions which will bring about a reaping of happiness and well-being for all as the children of matter obey the laws of matter so let the children of spirit obey the laws of spirit for the law of matter and the law of spirit are one but they are two aspects of one thing the outworking of one principle in opposite directions if we observe right principles or causes wrong effects cannot possibly accrue if we pursue sound methods no shoddy thread can find its way into our web of life no rotten brick enter into the building of our character to render it insecure and if we do true actions what but good results can come to pass for to say that good causes can produce bad effects is to say that nettles can be reaped from a sowing of corn he who orders his life along the moral lines thus briefly enunciated will attain to such a state of insight and equilibrium as to render him permanently happy and perennially glad all his efforts will be seasonally planted all the issues of his life will be good and though he may not become a millionaire as indeed he will have no desire to become such he will acquire the gift of peace and true success will wait upon him as its commanding master end of chapter six recording by andrea fiori www dot a n d r e a f i o r e dot name end of foundation stones to happiness and success by james allen